to call Christu. Christu Grayling, he is from South Africa. He lives in, at, at this time in the Netherlands. Thank you, Christu, for being here and uh, sharing with us a little bit of your, of your, of your life story, of, uh, of your own experience of, uh, of being reconciled to God's touch. Tell us a little bit of your, of your story. Yeah, thanks, Odir. My story started in, really in 1987, when I tested HIV positive while I was a theological student in the seminary here in Stellenbosch. You can think the moment you hear HIV positive at that stage, it was a death sentence. The doctor said to me, it might be a few months, it might be a few years, but you must be ready to die at any time. So there was all these millions of questions. How long? How long will I still survive? Uh, will it, what about marriage? Can I still get married? What about uh, my ministry? How, who will ever accept a reverend with AIDS? But I was lucky and very privileged because my, my spiritual reserves at that stage were full. So I knew that my life was anchored on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ and, and I knew I have hope. But in the midst of the crisis of hearing that I might be positive, I was really privileged to also have the people that I loved that were there for me. My friends were all theological students and they could easily have talked and teached me about what a friend we have in Jesus. But they didn't tell me about what a Jesus we, what a friend we have in Jesus. They showed me what a Jesus we have in a friend. And that makes a huge difference. My girlfriend at the time, Liesl, when I told her I'm HIV positive, I wanted to back out. But she said, I loved you before you became HIV positive. And the fact that you've got a virus don't change that. I'm going to marry you despite of that. 23 years later, she's still HIV negative. She really demonstrated to me what true love and commitment is. But we were also received huge grace in the other way, that uh, thanks to antiretrovirals, I could protect Liesl from getting infected, and we now have two HIV-negative children of our own. That's my privilege. But for many others, that's not a possibility. Two-thirds of people, of the 22 million people living with HIV, don't have access to antiretrovirals as I do. Hello, my name is Princess Kasune Zulu. I'm very humbled to be with you today. And just to tell you also my story of living with HIV. Many times when we hear of HIV or AIDS in particular, we think of people who are already dying. But in many cases, there are people like me who are healthy and who have so much to offer. And I think this great opportunity that we have here at Lausanne is a clear example that we as a church, we are called to be the hope for those who may feel hopeless. What is my story? Not only have I known what it is to lose both parents due to AIDS in the time when my mother was very sick. She could not even afford the very basic antifungal cream called Maconazo. We traveled five hours in one direction and came back the next five hours. I heard people crying and something told me my mother had died. And for sure, I never had a chance to say goodbye. I thought that was all. I thought we had my father that we would stay with. But alas, I was wrong. Within a short period of time, my father became very sick as well. I became the one to carry him several miles or kilometers, as we say, from one place to another, 15 kilometers at times, only to be given Panadol or Tylenol, as you may call it. Sooner or later, my father died as well. 
I thought, okay, at least we have each other as brothers and as sisters, but only to realize that in 1997, when I fall in love with these people who are dying of this mysterious disease, I wanted to know. And I was greeted with the news that women could not taste in Zambia without the permissions of their husbands. I said, how could this be? To me, I believe that that birthed in me the sense of agency and to become an advocate because I knew that if these women lack even $2 to feed themselves a day, how could they even want to walk several miles or use it for transport? Well, to cut the long story short, I was tasted. And when I went for my HIV test, the doctors asked, why do you want to know? And by the way, if you know, what else can you do? I said, maybe there's nothing that you, the medical people, can do for me, but I can take it to God in prayer. And that was my turning point. When I found out that I was HIV positive, I don't know how to explain it to you, but it felt like a bright light come hitting in my life, and I felt this ray of light coming, and there was unspeakable joy, and I felt these words that I should say, praise God. Of course, I didn't say them thinking, if I say that, the doctor will think I need psychiatric attention as well. <laughs> so I didn't say that. But out of that began this call or ministry where I began to realize that there is power in praising God in the midst of my affliction, and God can still be glorified with people living with HIV. Thank you. Thank you, Princess, for sharing um, your experience, a little bit of your story. But tell us a little bit more about how was your discovery, also the, the seed for your ministry. How did it become a ministry? I think for me, really, I was concerned, especially at the time, that the church wasn't really much involved. And I know that's in generalizing things, but especially in my local context, the church felt this is not our issue. It is for those people who maybe are promiscuous. But I had this burden to say, what about the women that many, many of them found themselves in this predicament without any fault of, of their own? What about the children who are born the, with the virus? And where is our voice as a church? So I ran with this scripture in Ezekiel 33 verse 3 that calls us to be a watchman, really, to warn the people, but also to be a voice for those who could come to the Lord. And I just felt like the church.